Good afternoon. My name is Afsane Beshlaz, founder of uh, Rock Creek. I want to welcome you all today to this great discussion. Um, we have our senior advisors and advisory board members around the table, and, uh, and we're going to be talking about the U.S. economy, the global economy, and how the markets are behaving, as well as workplace and inclusion and, uh, and ESG and uh, impact investing. So with that introduction, let's jump in. I'm going to introduce everyone in alphabetical order, and then we'll go from there. Carolyn Atkinson, who um, was former White House uh, Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economics, and also former head of policy for Google, as well as um, holding uh, t uh, various titles at the Bank of England and the IMF. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jessica Einhorn, um, who has been on the boards of BlackRock, Time Warner, NBR, Council on Foreign Relations, and many, many more. And uh, she was managing director of the World Bank and dean of, of size at John Hopkins. Um, and uh, Dame Diane Julius, um, chair of the Council of University College London and an advisory board member of uh, CIC in China, as well as uh, has been on the boards of Tomasek, uh, as well as uh, BP uh, Roche, um, and led uh, organizations like Chatham House and many, many others, and, uh, and also was founding member of uh, the Monetary Policy Committee of the Bank of England. Um, so amazing. And Dr. Laura Tyson, um, professor of the Haas School of Business at uh, UC Berkeley and chair of the Board of Trustees for the Blum Center for Developing Countries, Developing Economies. And uh, she has been chair of the President's National Economic Council, uh, dean of the Business School of the Haas School at Berkeley, uh, and most recently interim dean again. And she has also been a dean of the London Business School. I think the first woman to be mm -hmm. the and dean both, of that of business, schools. both of yeah. those schools. Mm -hmm. And she's been also on the boards of AT&T, Morgan Stanley, CBRE, and uh, many others, as well as nonprofits such as SASB. Um, so we are in April uh, at a very interesting time in the economy. The World Bank IMF meetings have just uh, recently finished. And uh, we have had also interesting numbers come out today about the U.S. economy, about the Chinese economy. And, uh, and it seems like um, the consensus has shifted uh, from one that assumed that we are in, a, in an economy that needs interest rate cuts to one um, that uh, interest rate uh, uh, rises uh, at least, uh, at least <laughs> of another half a percent, if not 75 basis points, to one that assumes that we need interest rate cuts, maybe. So a very interesting time in, uh, in the US. Of course, uh, we have had, again, uh, an extension to the life of uh, the Brexit discussion. So that goes on. And everybody has been watching China, of course, and given its huge, huge impact um, on, um, on not just Asia, but also the rest of the emerging world and really the rest of the developed world. So I think given um, where we are, I was going to start maybe with where we are um, at the Federal Reserve. Um, and obviously, um, Jay Powell has been doing a great job. And um, what we see is that that injection of capital post-2008 was a historical phenomenon, I think, uh, given the scale and how long it has taken. But now we're kind of in uncharted territory, and we've gone from the prospects, as we talked of the interest rates shifting from one end of the spectrum to the other. I was going to ask you all what you think of that, and where do you think see the course of the U.S. economy and what might happen to U.S. interest rates? Maybe we can start with you, Diane. Okay. I, I suspect that... Uh, the real lesson is that giving forward guidance is very difficult for central bankers and a dangerous occupation. Our, our own central banker in the Bank of England has found that. Um, now, of course, the Fed always publishes their projections, their dot plot. Um, that's, again, a very difficult uh, and, and uh, a hostage to fortune in a time like this because, of course, the, the short-term data changes. Mm -hmm. And I think that uh, it's uh, difficult for any central bank to balance what the short-term data seems to show and what their forecast, their best forecast, uh, of where the economy is actually going and where inflation is going in the longer run. Uh, in my view, of course, I don't have all the data that they have, um, but in my view, the short term does look 
pretty positive. Uh, inflation is not much above target. It's, I, I would say it's close enough. Uh, so that there's no particular need to move right now. Uh, but it does seem to me that interest rates over the medium term for the U.S. are probably still too low. Uh, that would get us into the whole debate about what the natural rate is for the U.S. economy. I'm sure we may have that debate. Um, but I suspect that what the Fed, where it is now, is actually pausing, not quite knowing whether it's going to step to one direction or the other. And I think when, there, when uncertainty is high, that's what you should do, is pause. Laura? A couple of things come to mind. Number one, I think the uncertainty of f facing Fed policymakers, we, we should not underestimate the fact that the kind of standard structural relationships on which monetary policy has been based, at least in the U.S., that those structural relationships appear not to hold the way they used to. So if I think about the relationship between productivity growth and wage growth, or between wage growth and inflation growth, or between inflation, wage growth, and the unemployment rate, and you run standard models about those relationships, and you try to understand contemporary reality, you find that the models are not predicting contemporary reality. I think that's really important. We, we don't actually know why wage growth has been so tepid relative to the unemployment rate. We don't actually know exactly why uh, productivity growth has not generated, has not been restored to the level we would think given all the other indicators we have about the economy. And so then I'm just going to... Is Phillips Curve dead then? Or? Phillips Curve is just, I would say, you have to, it, the, the standard estimates of the curve no longer work. Economists have been worrying about uh, inflation coming, and it's really the dog that hasn't barked. It's the dog or, that hasn't barked, yeah. And uh, yeah, right. we moved into a phase of unconventional monetary policy and QE as right. a response to the crisis and to the previous period of low real interest rates that were market, yes, uh, were determined. market, determined. market determined. And I wonder if we aren't now ready to move into a phase of unconventional fiscal policy, Maybe. where not just looking at the public finance and incentive aspects of fiscal policy, but where we, in a sense, go back mm -hmm. to uh, thinking, well, maybe uh, fiscal policy can help to regulate the macro economy, or maybe there is uh, a real need for investment, which makes sense for the public sector to do that investment at a time when it's able to borrow so cheaply. And I know that makes a lot of people uh, get anxious and worry again about inflation, but I think that we should uh, feel pretty confident mm -hmm. that inflation, inflation expectations, at least in the United States and in the advanced economies is pretty well anchored and we're anchored. able to and we've seen that the economy is pretty sensitive to interest rate moves mm -hmm. so if uh, if inflation does start to look as if it's taking off again uh, without any because wages are going up and productivity isn't keeping track then i think it'd be possible to react but for a long time i remember Back in 2010, <laughs> 2010, economists started to talk about, well, we had this special fiscal stimulus, we had a monetary stimulus after the crisis, and now we need to talk about our exit strategy from special Completely. things. Well, they were a decade too they soon. They were too soon, a decade too soon. Interesting. Too soon. Yes. I think um, it's also good to remind ourselves that uh, the decision makers are human beings, and it comes down um, to also a question of character and expertise. Mm -hmm. And we are very well served um, with the leadership of Jerome Powell, with the other people who are the governors, and also we recall that participants um, in these rate-making decisions are also representatives of different um, uh, presidents of uh, different parts of the central banking uh, groups in the United States. So you have people who are close to the ground in regions who can feel and understand what's happening in their economies. And then you have a group of people in Washington. And together, um, with reasoned discussion, they try to make decisions that are best for 
the growth and sustainability of the U.S. economy. So human beings matter, and I think character, independence, uh, and judgment come together. And I, for one, without making a prediction, feel comfortable in the hands of Jerome Powell and his present group of colleagues, and I would pay a lot of attention to additional appointments uh, to that board, yes. um, holding them to the same high criteria that we've had all along. How about the UK? You were at the Bank of England a while back, yeah, so yes. how, um, how do you think? I think the UK, the, the Monetary Policy Committee is reasonably comfortable at the moment. They've been shielded a bit by all the uncertainty about Brexit because what they've said is that uh, one cannot make a, a prediction. They have to make a forecast, of course, and the forecast is for a smooth exit of some sort. <laughs> it's a rather vague forecast, but I think it's a sensible forecast, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the latest uh, delay in the date by which Britain would have to leave or agree to something has been postponed again. So uh, this postponement, constant postponement, probably means that it's right for the central yeah, bank to make yeah. that kind of forecast. And they have succeeded in inching interest rates up a little bit, which gives them a little bit more flexibility should they need to, to drop uh, if there is uh, a, a really negative development on, on Brexit. There's no particular reason for them to move at the moment. Uh, you know, inflation on the various measures range from 1.9% to 2.2. You know, uh, so that's as close as you can get to a 2% right, target. That right. uh, the economy is fully employed. Um, there are all these uncertainties out there, certainly, but in terms of the starting point or the existing uh, place where the economy is, uh, it's growing slowly, you know, between one, one and one and a half percent probably. Um, but uh, that may be its current ability to grow. So moving right along, we can't not ask you about Brexit then. So what do you think is going to happen after October? Well, I think some things might happen before October even. Let's uh, hope so. It's, uh, <laughs> yes, one well, can't count Get on anything these days. But to. I think it's... So it won't uh, go to the, to the last hour of the last day? Uh, okay. It might. But even then, I think there'll be another extension. Then there would uh, be another extension. Because if we've, oh. learned, if we've learned anything, there's not a consensus in Parliament for any single outcome. And that's because there's not a consensus in the country for any single outcome. The, it really does range from those who are very strong believers that it's time to get out of the EU. And we need a deal, but no deal is better than the kind of deal that the compromise deal that's on offer. That's one extreme. And the other extreme is we should just revoke our, uh, request, our to request to leave and uh, go back to square one. Uh, so we will end up somewhere in the middle. Uh, and I think the, the current thinking is that this additional delay provides a little more time for essentially the two larger political parties, the Conservatives and the Labour Party, to come up with some kind of deal uh, where they would approve, they would both sides vote in Parliament to approve the exit deal, which is all we have on offer right now that, uh, that the EU and, and uh, the Conservatives have negotiated, approve the exit deal and attach to that an, an agreement that the position of Britain going into the next phase of negotiations should be something like a customs union a permanent customs union. That's what's talked about at the moment. Uh, if that happens, then the, uh, the deadline falls away, but the negotiations can begin on the next phase. That is, what is the arrangement? Because, of course, the EU has to agree to whatever is uh, at that stage as well. And I think in the, there's, of course, some possibility that that won't happen. If that doesn't happen, because there's n virtually uh, no, ma no majority anywhere, either in the con country or in Parliament or in the EU countries, for crashing out with no deal. I think that's very unlikely, and what would happen is there'll be another extension. So it's either, um, from the point of view of, the, of certainly the business community, uh, we've gotten quite used to having these delays. Uh, it's been three years already, now it's another year. People have made their individual contingency plans for um, the worst case, the no deal, and a, a recent uh, Bank of England survey showed that 80% of their contacts throughout the British Isles say they are prepared for no deal, should it happen. Uh, so, um, you know, the, the motto is, is keep calm and carry on. As you're talking about that, 
does that mean, you know, given what's going on in the old economies, <laughs> instead of calling it developed economies, the old economies, the old economies when you look economies. at China, yeah. that puts China in a mm -hmm. very different place. Does that make, what, is that what a sense? positive I mean, China advantage? Certainly has, China certainly has had a significant... Its own issues. They, they foc well, no, what but, I'm saying right. is they've, they've also focused a lot of their development strategy on urbanization. Uh, absolutely. So they absolutely have done that and taking large parts of the population and moving them to urban centers, right. and that's a long-term strategy. Absolutely. So, but they're um, growing over 6.4 percent. So, yes, so that is different than growing at 2 percent. It is because mm -hmm. the expectation if you're, if you're, wherever you are, your sense of expectations of, if, of future income gains based on what you saw happen to your family are pretty, pretty positive. So a lot of people say, when you hear, I mean, I've heard um, some of the Singaporean officials say this, when people worry about income inequality, say, in any country, or, and then they say, well, look, it also is true that there's income inequality in China, the view will be, yeah, but for the average, median to average uh, family, there's an expectation that has been demonstrated by r their recent history that they're going to be fine. Okay, so they, they don't really think too much about the top pulling away because they're pulling up with the top, okay? Well, you, so you but that's the critical poverty, thing that did right. not happen, has right. not been happening in the United States. And so. I don't think in the UK either, I yeah. don't know, but, but that's exactly right. I think we have to make that, I think it is an important distinction and the lack of equality does also result in polarization because it's just different levels of, you know, it was pointed out several years ago, people at the top solve their own problems. They solve their own problems through schools, through health, through the infrastructure of their community, through um, all of the services that you expect might be publicly provided to the population at large. The top can provide those. The middle feels like they're not getting what they need. Um, and that is not very healthy for democracy. No, but in China, with slower growth, do you think that there could be disappointed expectations there, which is obviously, I mean, there's obviously a lot of political concern now uh, with President Xi about preserving political stability. It's very high energy. And um, I am worried that in sort of US-China friction, the US is gonna build walls between that very vibrant tech community and our very vibrant tech community in ways that are actually gonna be quite damaging to our vibrant tech community. Unless, a lot of them will try to just go and be in the other one as much as they can be. But for example, we've already seen a fall off in Chinese investment coming into Silicon Valley because of the new law that basically puts, it, it allows, the U.S. government to look at any investment by any Chinese entity, large or small. Into any kind of startup. It, yes, but the focus is obviously going to be on tech. It is on tech. And already you can see the capital declining. So I, I just, I do worry about that. I think there is a very vibrant tech community in China. In China. And I think by many indicators, they're actually now ahead in some of the measures. Um, and if we try to wall this off or counter it in a, in a protective way, I think that will be, that's quite dangerous to us. But Laura, yeah. what about the there's standard? A, there's an argument in the other direction that um, the, uh, the presumptions um, uh, for so many decades were um, to allow the Chinese to be exceptions. And there was, of course, a great deal of theft um, and intellectual property being yeah, stolen and, um, and competitors from the U.S. Uh, being prevented mm -hmm. um, from uh, being on a, a level playing field. Uh, so I think um, that part of the reaction uh, now to the Chinese is probably healthy for both parties mm -hmm. in the sense that um, the U.S. Uh, needed mm -hmm. um, to reverse that sense that um, China would not be questioned because um, it was an important part of the growth of the, uh, of the global economy, but rather that they um, could not treat uh, US or indeed European investors um, in ways that were discriminatory and at the same time 
uh, be allowed. And I think um, this relatively sto small story about the Confucius Institutes um, that have been um, gifts of the Chinese government on some major universities and that are now being examined and seen to be um, uh, not as tra transparent or as benign as people thought they were um, is part of the same story of everyone becoming realistic um, and, uh, and not gilding you know, um, the Can truth. Can I sort of take what you're talking about? You know, last week, uh, again, um, there was a discussion with Christine Lagarde, and people were talking about maybe going, we might be going from one reserve currency to three reserve currencies, US dollar, euro, right. renminbi. You're talking about Chinese, you know, in terms of innovation and AI. And there's a lot of discussion about China getting ahead there. So if, if US loses the single currency, reserve currency, position if you think that's, you know, gives you a lot of controls that you might not have otherwise if you don't have, if you don't hold the reserve currency. Mm -hmm. If in terms of AI, especially what we're reading is the Chinese, as you said, they love it particularly in the implementation phase. They're being right. not in just innovative in the creation, right. but also in implementation, implementation, they're so far ahead. Right. I know right. that, you know, here at Rock Creek, we're using AI every day, yeah. but when we talk to the rest of the financial sector here, the U.S. is generally behind. There are all these payment systems that are structured mm -hmm. and they're fossils relative to the systems in not just China but other uh, emerging markets that are leapfrogging. Yeah. Um, so does that, and then of course, you know, you look at the railways. Um, World Bank <laughs> did the first, uh, first bullet train in Japan and now we're looking at the last uh, recent uh, train in uh, Dallas airport <laughs> and that's going to be a very, very slow train well, here. <laughs> Um, so what does that tell us when you look at it as economists, as leaders of financial organizations, as academics? How do you put this all together? There's clearly a problem about the public sector in the U.S., yes. Uh, yes. the trains and, and the maybe and infrastructure, which is traditionally very difficult to attract private investors. And in the United States, it's maybe more difficult even than it is in some European countries, because unlike in France, where you might be a toll road provider and you reckon you get in the United States, if you try to uh, buy an airport, dare I say, you know, in Chicago, it turns out there are an awful lot of regulators and state and local and political interests that make that hard. I think though, there's also just to get back to Afsani's right. question, which right. I think is a really it's interesting one uh, about uh, mm -hmm. reserve currencies. It, I think there's very little chance that in the next five years, mm -hmm. say, uh, yes. the RMB will become a significant reserve mm -hmm. currency. And in fact, if you look at the data, it kind of peaked a few years ago and has come down, mm -hmm. mainly because China itself has stopped uh, making it a condition in some of their trade mm -hmm. deals with other countries that trade between the two countries would be based on um, RMB yeah, prices. Right. Uh, so I think the dollar in the short term is safe-ish. Uh, but it's another one of those cases where we could really shoot ourselves in the foot. Uh, what really worried me was when SWIFT was being used mm -hmm. as a weapon. Political. Yes, you know, a weapon. It's because that is, uh, that is a lethal weapon for any even right. large country, be it Chinese or, or others, mm -hmm. uh, having any kind of business relationship with the U.S. and therefore needing to go through the dollar in order to consummate trades. Mm -hmm. I, I think the fact that um, the Treasury apparently approved it, or if they didn't, Trump did it anyway, um, to actually cut that off from DTZ and then threaten it with Huawei uh, is actually an extremely dangerous route to go. Because of course, the way one protects oneself against that, if you're China, uh, is to make sure that your own currency you is what you, so you, you have so you maybe you now some of that could be positive some mm -hmm. in the sense that opening up China's capital market a little bit would probably be good for everybody uh, but it that would really accelerate the decline mm -hmm. of the dollar as as yeah. the safe haven international currency it, when is the China um, China US trade agreement happening I think the a very important thing is you can announce an agreement. I need to see what's in the agreement, okay? okay? Because we could end up with something which, 
you know, we, we, we talk about the new deal with Mexico and Canada, whose name I can't remember, as something entirely new when it's actually a couple of new things added on to NAFTA. Oh, wow. it's, not, it's not dramatically new. So I don't know what this agreement is going to say. And, and it's been, uh, it's, it's just predict, because we've said we're going to go after a lot of the kind of industrial policies that actually uh, promote the development of this technological threat to us. I don't think we have the tools to do that. I don't actually think we have the right to actually insist on their not following their industrial policy. But will they do something? I mean, what are they going to offer? I, I, so I don't know. I don't know. I we might. Soybeans. Uh, if, if it's going to be, if it's going to be a reduction in tariffs to buy more of U.S. commodities, I will not consider that to be a good trade a good agreement. Trade. Okay, no, that will not be a trade agreement. That will be a cessation of hostility. I would like to ask on this question of China and technology, um, the use of the artificial intelligence, the facial recognition, facial recognition. technology in China, right. I find. Um, sort of freezes my heart, um, and um, and it goes back to that issue again about the vibrancy of democracy um, as the technological tools for um, dictatorship states uh, increase. And I wondered, in terms of uh, being in China um, or or in the other places, whether it's uh, Russia and other places. Uh, whether there's a, a worry about the facial, about the uh, role of technology in strengthening the hands of despots. Or in affecting the outside world. I, just a quick an anecdote. Somebody told me they attended China's Development Forum this year, yes. which they'd done before, and as they were walking down the corridor, they saw their face right. on a, a big screen with a little description of them, which was obviously, uh, you know, done as a showing off yeah, of uh, boasting, the and uh, and uh, led this person to think that is just creepy, mm -hmm. and so certainly for now maybe it goes down fine in China. I don't know. In the United Kingdom, there's an awful lot of CCTV. There is, there is. Although it shocked me that the last time I yes. went to, to, through a Chinese airport, that all of a sudden I had to ha had to be photographed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and that hadn't been the case six months before that. But here's uh, the thing. And, but it's happening. I think there's it's no, there's no way think, to get around it I don't think, I don't think there's now. any way to get around it. And I, I don't, ultimately, it's, it's a citizen. So I've been in these discussions where people talk about, you know, we need to, we need to worry about trade because uh, we need to make sure that China doesn't get the technology to uh, pursue undemocratic values. And I said, I don't think that actually trade policy is about trying to encourage a country to pursue democratic or, or non-democratic values. I don't, I don't, you, just can't, you just can't do it. It's not the right instrument. You can do it. It was, in right. fact, in the Articles of Agreement of the IMF, and it was, in yeah. fact, the template of the first 50 years, which but was but basically, ago, yeah. if you build, uh, it was to try and build a liberal international economy based on constitutional democracy. And the whole idea was whole idea. that um, the two were linked. And what we're discovering is that they're not, they're not linked. linked.